everyone and welcome to a new video. In today's video I'm going to be making the somewhat ridiculous ensemble that I'm currently wearing and this ensemble actually came from a vintage pattern. I believe it is from the late 19s or maybe even the early 1920s and it is actually a McCall's pattern, specifically number 8399. Now I know this style isn't particularly flattering on me, I didn't think I'd be following more patterns from this period, but this one really caught my eye because it was so ridiculous and it included an equally ridiculous hat pattern. And you know how much I love my hats. <laughs> this is an eight piece pattern and they describe it as a lady's apron with reversible fronts, body and sleeve in one, detachable cuffs and head protector. I absolutely adore the fact that they call the hat a head protector. There's something hilarious about that to me. Even though the design of this pattern is quite delightful, the instructions aren't because there aren't very many instructions at all. Usually vintage patterns at least have a diagram that kind of makes the construction process clearer, but this pattern doesn't even have that. Instead, the numbers on the diagram of this dress correspond with information about what pieces those are, not how those pieces go together. So I kind of ignored all of the instructions during the assembly of this dress, but I do think it was fairly intuitive to put together. Now the reason I want to follow this pattern right now is because it's kind of reminiscent of 1920s evening coats and I want to make a whole bunch of coats throughout December. The construction of it is actually quite similar to a coat since it doesn't have any closures down the front. Instead, it is just secured with a belt and a buckle. This was very common in dresses from the 19s, uh, and that's why they're referred to as aprons, because they didn't have traditional closures like most garments do. Instead, layers were worn and fabric overlapped itself in a way that made it modest enough, even without a bunch of closures. So it's a really interesting construction method. And on that note, let's cut to the footage of constructing this. The main fabric for this project is a burnout velvet, which I bought online from Joann's. It also happens to be a stretch velvet, and if I had known that when I bought it, I would not have bought it, but I'm very pleased with the actual color and design of it. I think it's beautiful. The two largest pattern pieces, which make up the front and the back of the dress, were pinned and cut for the velvet. And I specifically pinned the pattern on with an additional one inch allowance at the center back edge since this was a little small for me. I also cut the top portion of the hat out from this fabric. The remaining pieces, which were the belt, cuffs, and band of the hat, were cut from a silk dupioni. This pattern also had optional collar and pocket pieces, but I wanted to keep it simple and I didn't want to try and stitch those onto the velvet, so I simply set them aside. Then I started backing the Dupioni pieces with fusible interfacing to give them a little more structural integrity, and I started with the belt pieces. After ironing the fusible interfacing on and trimming away any excess, I pinned the two belt pieces together with the right sides facing each other. Then I stitched around all the edges with a 3 8 of an inch allowance. The belt was turned so the right sides were facing outward, then ironed. And I stitched around all the edges once again, except this time I'm top stitching a quarter inch away from the edge. Visible top stitching was shown on this pattern, so I just decided to go for it. Now onto the cuffs. These were cut out from the Duo Peony 2, then I cut out fusible interfacing for them, and I also cut out a layer of lining for them from muslin. The interfacing was ironed on, then I pinned the cuffs to the lining with the right sides facing each other, and I stitched them together across the top edge with a 3 8 of an inch allowance. The curves were clipped, then I turned the sleeves right side out and gave it a good iron. Now, shockingly, I fused interfacing to the back of the brim pieces of the hat. Sorry, head protector. <laughs> Like with the belt, they instructed me to cut this piece out twice, so I can only assume that it is intended to be lined with matching material. So both pieces were pinned together with the right sides facing each other, and I stitched around the edges with a 3 8 of an inch allowance, but left a large opening across one of these straight edges so I could turn it out easily. Like with the cuffs, the curves were clipped, then I turned the piece right side out and gave it a good old iron. And more top stitching. 
I figured I would carry on with the assembly of the head protector, so I transferred the perforations on the pattern to my fabric. Then I removed the pattern and pinned the hat pieces together. And I repeated these steps with the hat lining, which is more of that black dupioni. They don't mention the hat being lined, but I wanted to give it some structure since the velvet is so flimsy. It would be sad if those obnoxious points were droopy. I bet you're all shocked to hear me talk about head protectors and droopy points in a video. <laughs> I sewed around three of the edges with a 3 8 of an inch seam allowance, leaving one of the long edges free. That will function as the opening. The corners were clipped and the velvet layer was turned right side out. Then I stuffed the lining inside with the wrong sides facing each other and pinned it so the seams, edges, and corners were matching. The dubioni is pretty prone to fraying, so I bound the layers together across the bottom edge with lace binding. Then I stuffed the hat with the book to keep the layers separated and pinned on the brim. This was easy enough to do, I just made sure the center points lined up and it was placed evenly on both sides. Also, you might notice me only pinning it to just past the side seams, and that's because the brim is only sewn on to this point. The back portion is secured with buttons later on. With it pinned accordingly, I began sewing it on by hand with slip stitches. I clearly didn't mind visible top stitching on this piece, but I had already stitched around the edges of the brim and thought an additional line of stitching would look messy. And believe it or not, this was actually one of the easiest and least fiddly parts of making the hat. Trust me, I ended up making 10 of them. <laughs> Now I overlapped the back of the brim until it resembled the image on the pattern. And now I needed buttons. Despite owning copious quantities of buttons, I didn't have anything that matched well in my stash. So I decided to use some coverable buttons with a complementary silk that I had on hand. This is done by cutting out circles of material. Then the material gets pressed into a plastic mold. Then the shell of the button is placed on top and the edges of the fabric are tucked around it. Then the backing is placed on top and a die is pressed on top of that. The pressure put on the die causes the layers to snap together and form a fabric covered button. You can get these from Joann's or most craft stores or you can buy them in bulk for significantly less money on Etsy or eBay. The hat was supposed to close with buttonholes, but I wasn't confident in the positioning of them, so I sewed the buttons on top of the crown, which keeps everything in place permanently. That means they aren't functional, but it's more practical. And it'd be really hard to do them up once the hat is actually on your head anyway, so I don't think it's a big deal. I also sewed tacking stitches at the corners of the hat to keep the lining positioned properly. And the glorious hat, or head protector, depending on what terminology you prefer, of everyone's dreams is done. Now onto the dress. I transferred the perforations that mark the belt and button placements onto the left front panel, along with the perforations for the button placement on the sleeves. And some of those perforations marked a slit that the belt passes through. Since this fabric is quite stretchy and flimsy, I decided to back the slit with a medium weight wool. So I marked the slit onto the wool, then matched the ends with the markings on the dress panel. I pinned it on, then stitched an eighth of an inch away from the line all the way around the line, like you would do with a bound buttonhole. I cut across the line and clipped the corners, then the wool scrap was turned inward. I pinned around the edges of the slash until the wool was no longer visible from the right side, and I top stitched around it. In hindsight, I wish I had secured this by hand since the top stitching is a little wonky, but it is hidden by the belt, so I'm not too bothered. I'm just a little bothered. Now the belt is pinned to the front panel with the notches aligned, and it was stitched on with a half inch allowance. Then I pinned the back panel to the front panel, across the shoulder with the notches matched and edges even. For some reason, one edge was several inches longer than the other, and it was like this on both sides, which makes me think that these should have been gathered slightly before being stitched together, but there is no indication of that on the pattern or in the instructions. Anyway, this seam and all the seams from now on were stitched with half inch allowances. And one nice thing about this fabric is that it doesn't fray, so further seam finishing wasn't really necessary. And I would have stitched this with a narrow zigzag stitch since that is better suited for stretch fabrics, 
but my tabletop machine kept trying to eat this fabric as opposed to sewing it, so I used my straight stitch industrial instead. Then I cut out strips of the velvet that were approximately two inches wide. These were sewed together with a narrow allowance, then sewed onto the entire front edge of the robe with the right sides facing each other. This is going to be turned inward and function as a narrow facing slash hem binding. I did this instead of simply turning the edges inward because I wasn't confident that the velvet would stay turned inward with the half inch hem allowance that they provided. This weights the edges and makes it look a little nicer if the edges do flip outward. And to encourage this to turn inward, and stay turned inward, I understitched across the entire edge, which is basically flattening the seam allowance and binding out, then sewing very close to the edge where it meets the main piece of fabric. This is another one of those things that I forget exist, and I need to do it more often. <laughs> now I'm turning the facing slash binding inward, and turning the raw edge inward by a half inch, leaving me with a one inch wide band all the way around the interior of the robe. I originally stitched this on with whip stitches, but they puckered really badly. There was a lot of resistance when sewing through this fabric. Something about the elastic fibers made it feel gummy to stitch through, and caused it to bunch up even when I was being very careful. I've seriously never had issues like this with any other fabric that I've ever worked with before. So I ended up removing all of these stitches and instead ran a running stitch all the way around. I still had problems with the fibers grabbing onto my needle, but the stitching was easier to smooth out. In hindsight, I would have made these strips a lot wider and backed them with interfacing before stitching them on. I didn't do that originally because I was worried about affecting the drape of the garment, but I think it would have done more good than harm and added a bit more shape to it. Now I'm pinning the cuffs on. The original dress just has the cuffs secured with two buttons. That's why it's advertised with detachable cuffs. And if I was using a lighter fabric or something with more structure to it, I probably could have done that. But this fabric would just stretch and warp out of shape and end up looking awful. So I decided to sew the cuffs on directly and I'm manipulating the fabric so it fits the top edge of the cuff. I stitched the cuffs on by machine as close to the edge as I possibly could. Then I cut off the excess, and because the sleeve was meant to hang and extend past the top edge of the cuff with the original construction method, there was quite a lot to trim off. And again, this fabric doesn't fray, and I wasn't planning on wearing this often enough to justify finishing the edges. Now I'm just sewing the buttons on. They aren't functional, but they are a nice addition to the garment anyway. Now I'm matching up the notches and pinning the side seams. Like with the other seams, this was sewn with a half inch allowance, and even though I planned on sewing this whole thing with a stretch stitch, it held up surprisingly well with the straight stitch. I just made sure to keep my stitches very tiny, so if any of them did break, there'd be lots to spare. That's how sewing works, right? <laughs> I turned the bottom edge of the cuffs inward by a half inch twice to create a neat rolled hem, and this was stitched by hand with slip stitches. And I also whip stitched the seam allowance for the cuff down, since unlike the velvet, this seam frayed quite badly, and this does help it, at least a little bit. Now onto closures, or should I say closure, since there is only one. A button at the right of the waist, which hooks through a buttonhole on the belt. So I marked that and stitched the buttonhole by machine. I have gotten slightly better at sewing buttonholes by hand, but I'm still not very good at sewing them into very thin fabrics because I can't get the tension right for the life of me. The buttonhole was slit open and fray checked, then I sewed a button onto the dress as was marked by the perforations. The final step was the hem. I ended up turning the bottom edge inward by a half inch, then inward by a full inch. I totally forgot to add additional hem allowance to this, and I don't think any was actually included in the original pattern, but ended up being a really nice length on me. So that was lucky. And it was sewn with running stitches by hand, since whip stitches betrayed me so deeply earlier on. And with that, my dress was done! I wore this over an underbust corset and my new American Duchess shoes. And I think it makes a handsome ensemble that happens to match the couches I recovered a while back perfectly. Last week, some of you thought it was weird that I made a dress to go with a pair of shoes. How about making a dress to go with your Victorian sofas? Is that more or less weird? <laughs>
let me know. <laughs> I'm actually pleasantly surprised with this piece overall. It's more flattering than I was expecting, which I think is thanks to the clingy velvet. It definitely wasn't nice to work with, and it wasn't what I expected, but it worked out in the end. I actually think all the textiles look really nice together, and of course, I love the head protector. I want one in every color. I think these could replace all other headwear out there. It's both the past and the future, though not the present just yet. Anyway, I had fun with this one, and I hope you did too. Too. If you did enjoy it, then giving it a like and a comment really helps me out. And if you want to see more content, then you can subscribe too. And for even more content, I have a Patreon with at least two exclusive videos uploaded to it monthly. So if you want to support me over there, then you can. There will be a link to that in the description box down below, along with everything else that I mentioned in this video. Not everything, but all the easily linkable things. Thanks for watching, and I will talk to all of you very soon.